Hello, my name is Jeff Farbman from the Wallace Center at Winrock International. Welcome to the National Good Food Network webinar, Crop Insurance for Small Farms at Crash Course. Crop insurance has been around for a long time, but only recently have there been widely available good options for the diversified grower. This webinar will teach you about crop insurance in general and then go deep into whole farm revenue protection. This webinar is made possible with support from the USDA Risk Management Agency. We're working with a host of organizations on that project, including the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative at the University of Arkansas School of Law, Farm Credit East Central Oklahoma, Farm Credit Council, Morse Marketing Connections, the Choctaw and Muskogee Creek Nations, and the Muskogee uh, Food Sovereignty Institute. Okay, so let me uh, introduce you to the Wallace Center, which is a business unit of Winrock International and is the host of the NGFN webinar series. The Wallace Center has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 25 years. Today, the center supports entrepreneurs and communities as they build a new 21st century food system that is healthier for people, the environment, and the economy. The center serves the growing community of civic, business, and philanthropic organizations involved in building a new good food system in the United States. In particular, we're focused on advancing regional, collaborative efforts around the country to move good food, healthy, green, fair, affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into larger scale wholesale channels. The National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center. It is structured as a network of networks, ensuring efficient flow of information and innovation from boots on the ground projects to the national level and back down to the uh, grassroots level across the nation. The Wallace Center uh, coordinates and supports the network. Our goals are to work with the growers to ensure that there's an abundant supply of good food to meet the high consumer demand for the product, to collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our networks and partners have had so that we can continue to increase support for regional healthy food. You can learn more about the great work of the National Good Food Network on our website, ngfn.org. Since 2013, Janie Hip has served as the director of the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative um, at the University of Arkansas School of Law, uh, and she has a companion title of visiting law pro professor of law. Prior to, prior to joining the School of Law, she was the senior advisor for tribal relations to Tom Vilsack, secretary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. She is the founder of the USDA's Office of Tribal Relations in the Office of the Secretary and served two terms in the USDA's Secretary's Advisory Committee for Beginning Farmers and Ranchers. She is an LLM graduate of the University of Arkansas Law School's Agricultural Food and Law Pro Agricultural and Food Law Program, and she holds a JD from Oklahoma City University and a BA in Social Work from the University of Oklahoma. Janie. Yes, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me, and um, it's good to be with everyone today. Um, have you pushed control over to me yet? Yes. All right. So um, thanks, everybody. And it's really great to get the information that you did uh, provide us through the poll. Um, uh, we kind of went into this a little bit not knowing who would show up in terms of uh, you know, wh what size of your operation, how diversified it would be, um, or uh, whether or not you had had any exposure to crop insurance. So my first, uh, this first part of our slides here, I'm going to go through very quickly. Ever, all this information is going to be archived, and we can actually follow up, and we would be very much appreciative of doing some follow-up uh, webinars in this space because uh, there is a lot going on in crop insurance, and it can be quite detailed and kind of dense to walk through, and uh, we don't have any illusions that we're going to cover every single thing today. But when I talk to farmers, and I've been talking to farmers for 35 years at this point, uh, the question always comes up in meetings, you know, why crop insurance? Why do I need it? Um, and I, I, I always start at the beginning on this. When you're really thinking about um, how to uh, structure your, your business and try to structure the ongoing uh, work in, in farming and ranching, uh, most of us don't go into it thinking that we're only going to be a flash in the pan. Uh, most of us uh, go into it knowing that we love it uh, very much and we want to stay with it for a very long time. And so um, 
as a lawyer and as somebody who's worked in risk management for quite some time now, um, I always like to start at the beginning. Um, there's five areas of risk. Uh, these are the ones that are generally talked about among most agriculture circles at length. Um, each one of these areas needs a plan. Um, and each one of these you will um, can be quite detailed, but you really should at some point in your farming and ranching and food career, um, you know, sit down and actually ponder uh, these particular areas. And I'm going to quickly go through those with you. Um, marketing, financial, legal, human resource, and production risk. I will uh, kind of take up the last one at the very end because crop insurance is a key way to plan for production risk. But it also can help you in some of your other areas as well. You know, when you're dealing with marketing risk, you're, you need to really walk yourself through what's your market. Do you know your marketing opportunities? How often do you review those options? Do you have a plan? And how often do you review and update it? A lot of us go through, um, you know, the process of planning before we start our, our journey and, and food. And, and then sometimes we never revisit those plans. And it's very uh, sort of a dangerous thing to do. We we do need to you know discipline ourselves to ever so often sit down and work through you know our marketing plans. Crop insurance actually has a role and can help you kind of deal with um, the the your your marketing plan and bringing it to fruition in in very unique ways. And we'll get into those in just a little bit. Uh, financial risk. Uh, do you have a business plan? Is it current? Have you considered good times? Um, good times can mean a lot of things, but in the context of what we're talking about today, to me, increasing your income uh, with relation to your, your food enterprise, I kind of see that as a good time, at least for this conversation. Or bad times can be a de decrease in your income from the operation. Uh, what's your cost of production? What are your break-even costs? Your, what are your balance sheets, cash flow, income statements say? What is your debt to asset ratio? What is your debt level? Um, what is your tolerance for debt? Uh, what are your financing options? Um, what is your tax liability? And you know, do you have a system in place to actually gather the data and the information you need so that you can actually file your taxes appropriately and, and take advantage of of the things that are out there at USDA that really hinge on, on good tax records. Um, crop insurance um, is, again, a tool. Um, is, is it adequate to repay your current operating loans? Um, is the lack of having crop insurance in a, in a bad time going to place your entire operation at risk? Um, will, it, will crop insurance and having it in your back pocket allow you to take advantage of marketing opportunities? Um, and I will tell you, uh, as I talk to uh, lenders around the country, lenders are more and more looking at, you know, if, if a crop insurance tool is out there, are you actually availing yourself of the use of that crop insurance? Because it really puts your lender in a better circumstance in terms of seeing you as a, as a good uh, credit risk if you are thinking about taking out a loan to actually you know, have an operating um, amount in your bank account or, or expand or scale up. So most lenders that I know feel a little bit more secure when you actually have crop insurance if, there's, if it's out there to avail yourself of. As a lawyer, I, I tend to spend a lot of time in the legal risk arena. And legal risk can cover a whole lot of uh, areas. Uh, you'll see my last bullet there is, P.S., this isn't a complete list of all legal issues. But I did cover uh, quite a few um, uh, of potential areas of legal risk that a lot of farmers should think about, at least um, train yourself to think about ever so often. I'm not saying you should take yourself away from what you love, which is the production side of things. but it really makes for a, a strong and more solid operation if you uh, make yourself be in these spaces uh, from time to time. And those can range from you know, a will, an estate plan, a farm succession plan, an exit strategy, um, as well as an entrance strategy. Um, do you have general liability insurance policies? I've underlined in that next bullet food safety liability because that is of growing concern to a lot of folks. Um, it's a legal risk regardless of whether you are GAP um, certified or, or have good plans in place. There still is lurking 
you know, food safety liability that you need to think about and think through how you're going to plan to address. Um, have you read your contract, uh, your leases, your loan documents? Are you a business entity? Um, are you in compliance with labor laws, environmental laws, land use laws? Um, none of these are particularly, they may seem overwhelming when you think about them um, and, their, and the, uh, the vast number of areas to, to consider. But uh, if we just kind of uh, systematically walk through them, every operator that I know that's been at it for a long time has a, a good working knowledge of a lot of these areas and how they fit, affect their operation. Human resources risks. Um, do you have personal insurance? Is it adequate? Do you have medical and disability? A lot of people wonder why I throw that in, and the reason why is that, is that farming and ranching, no matter what your production systems are, um, is one of the um, more dangerous occupations that you can actually put your arms around. So it's important to think about those kinds of issues as you're planning your, your business. Uh, do you have employees? Um, have you considered your liability for their actions? Have you trained them on safety issues? Uh, how do you work within your own family? And are you keeping up with your own growth and education? And then finally, I, I like to throw in, who are your advisors? Uh, many of us are mentoring each, each other very, very well. And I would consider those advisors. But uh, when you get to the level that you can, it's very important to actually think about having a financial advisor or an accountant or a bookkeeper or somebody who can be on that side of the equation and also um, having some access to legal advice from time to time is going to be helpful. Uh, and then production risk. When was the last time you evaluated your risk of crop or livestock loss? How closely do you track the weather and its effects on your operation? Are you keeping track of uh, uh, pests and animal or plant diseases that might be spreading into your area? Do you have alternative production plans if your production risk becomes too great? Uh, do you have knowledge necessary to implement a new production system? Have you done a SWOT analysis lately? I don't know what they are calling it these days, but I tend to just uh, go back to the uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for your operation. Um, water, all of us know that water is, is continuing to be um, a looming issue that, that all of us are going to have to be dealing with a lot more carefully. So uh, just you know, getting, getting a handle on our water issues uh, surrounding our production systems is extremely important. Um, and then crop insurance in that context, a lot of us think about crop insurance as a, as a hedge on production risk, but it truly can have a, a more pervasive um, ability to stabilize the operation. Um, as it kind of moves through its own life. It's been around uh, in various forms since the 30s. Um, it has, Congress has had a long history of addressing disasters through disaster bills, but I, I think uh, uh, Gordon and Dean would probably, who are our next speakers, would probably echo me here. I think those days are passing into memory. Congress has been trying for many, many years to make sure that we that they don't have to deal with disaster after disaster in separate bills that have to make their way through Congress and, and really move more towards um, a full-on full private um, insurance industry that deals with these kinds of losses to agriculture. Um, crop insurance is designed to cover losses that are unavoidable and due to naturally occurring events in general. Um, it doesn't cover losses due to negligence or failure to follow good farming practices. And, uh, good farming practices vary from crop to crop and region to region, as you know. And um, one of the questions I always get, well, what does that mean? Well, there's actually language within the crop insurance infrastructure that talks about, you know, what are good farming practices. And uh, there's a slide a little later that can give you a little bit more information about that. Um, but you need to uh, kind of search out extension agents and crop and agronomists and horticulturists and people who, um, who can advise you in that space. All, every farmer I've ever known um, has always felt fully, uh, if they weren't a PhD, they felt they were. And I totally understand that and I honor that in all of you. Um, but uh, for, ter for purposes of, of uh, determining good farming practice, it's really good to make sure that you know who the, who the published experts are in any particular crop or any particular region. And, uh, follow them very closely so that you can see what they're actually suggesting are the best practices. Uh, the current production um, 
the current crop insurance infrastructure recognizes organic uh, practices as good farming practices, so there's quite a few definitions in a lot of the new policies that deal with those particular issues. So how does it work? And uh, Gordon and Dean, I'm going to fly through this. I know you're going to probably touch on some of these things as well, but the whole infrastructure of crop insurance is hinged on se several several kind of pivotal activities that, that uh, happened at the congressional level. And that this slide particularly, I'm not going to go into it in any length, but it shows you some of the history of how we ended up with the system that we have right now. Um, and, uh, Risk Management Agency didn't exist back in the 30s um, at all. Uh, it was it's a recent iteration in 1996 that was actually created. And Congress continues, as the Farm Bill comes up, to continue to improve and, and, and work on the whole crop insurance industry and the uh, policies that surround it. I'll tell you, though, our, uh, the frontline folks uh, in the crop insurance world although it is a regulatory infrastructure that, that has RMA involved in it as a, as a federal agency and has the FCIC um, involved in it as its overarching umbrella, the boots on the ground are your agents. And it's very good to reach out. And one of the last slides in my stat is I, I've offered you some, some links, and this will be archived, um, that you can go to and actually see who the crop insurance um, agents are and the companies are that are kind of out there uh, all over the country. And, and I really uh, encourage you to reach out and, and get a deeper understanding. Uh, the number of product, products, insurance products and the types of crops covered continues to increase. There's hundreds of crops covered now. Livestock is covered. And then Dean and uh, Gordon are going to go into this new um, whole farm revenue product, which is um, I think holds extremely great promise. In the beginning, only a handful of row crops were covered, but that's not the circumstances we are in now. Um, as demand for products increases, more products will likely come online into the future. I would be shocked if that didn't happen. Uh, but producers, if producers don't use the products, or or then the, then why are they even necessary? So so it's really important to to get out there, understand them, make a good informed decision about whether to use them or not. But if you kind of say no products are for me, then um, I really kind of push you to, to go out and see if that is exactly the case. Um, back in the day, a lot of folks did say that there aren't any products out there for me, but I think that circumstance has changed quite a bit. Um, good farming practice, practices in general, uh, failure to use such care as a reasonably prudent or careful person would use in similar circumstances regarding reasonable production methods. That's a pretty broad statement, but that tends to guide the whole good farming practices issue. Um, there's actually language in the uh, production, in the crop insurance industry and in the regulations that talk about conventional or sustainable farming practices as well as organic farming practices. And, um, and again, uh, they tend to use language uh, referring to organic ag or sustainable ag experts in the area. So making sure that who you consider to be an expert in this area is, is made known to the, to the regulatory um, infrastructure is really important. But I'll tell you, um, record keeping is critical. Record keeping for crop insurance is critical, but it's critical for every stage of your business anyway. The sloppier your records are, the less likely you are to get insurance or get paid fully against your losses. How and what you produce, uh, what you do to protect your production, documentation as to the day and the time and the actions you take. It's very important to be precise. Uh, your records need to be tied to each insurable unit of production. You've got to keep those records in a safe place, and uh, the visor in the truck is not a safe place. Um, who, what, when, where, how, and why. As a lawyer, I constantly tell people, I just need you to think through those things. Who, what, when, where, how, and why. And now it's a lot easier. I mean, we've got smartphones, we've got technology, we've got all sorts of, of um, aids to help us keep better records. So the exercise of keeping records is, is now a lot easier than it used to, but it's absolutely critical when you're dealing with crop insurance as well as all aspects of your operation. Um, Disease is an insured peril. If you don't take reasonable action, though, to prevent or address disease issues, then your level of indemnity for loss could be affected. 
Um, keeping up with pending disease outbreaks in your areas or knowing uh, ways to control whatever production system you use and what is acceptable in that framework is very important to get connected with local experts and stay connected with them. Um, experts are actually identified in a lot of the literature um, as those types of uh, trained professionals, but there's a lot of other folks who have the school of hard knocks training that can very easily be seen as experts, but we've got to identify them to, to have them recognized within the system. The slides now are, are a couple of a few common mistakes made by producers. Um, you'll have them, you'll have access to them. Um, the availability in every county for every crop, I think it's really important to, to you know, avail yourself of the knowledge to make sure that you know what is actually available and not assume that it's not available. There's so much out there now that is available for you. Uh, records are incredibly important. Reporting on time, meeting all your dates and policy deadlines is very important. Um, again, I've included some myths about crop insurance. Um, you're welcome to read those on your own. And some guidance slides about what uh, crops to choose and what coverage level. And then you've really got to sit down and ask yourself, you know, just look yourself in the mirror and determine what your risk exposure is. Only you can answer that in terms of how much risk that you can take on. Um, and that depends on each person's circumstances. Um, uh, the, this crop insurance links, those are some great links that I just provide to you for your further uh, review. Uh, lots of information on each one of those links. Um, and I included a, a couple of slides that RAPI has just recently uh, released, I think last week, that talk about uh, AGR, AGR Lite, which are some specific products uh, in relation to the new WFRP, uh, which Dean and Gordon are going to go into right now. So be informed, get knowledgeable, educate yourself, and Gordon and Dean, it's all yours. <laughs> Thanks, Janie. Gordon Killian started in the crop insurance business in 1998 as an agent and eventually a part owner of the Sloan Levitt Agency in Othello, Washington. In 2005, Northwest Farm Credit Services purchased the crop insurance portfolio and at that time he joined Northwest Farm Credit Services team. Gordon has worked as an agent, vice president insurance services, regional vice president, and now vice president insurance administration. Currently his areas of responsibility are corporate insurance reporting, budgeting, and insurance training. Gordon lives in Ritzville, Washington with his wife of 32 years and the youngest two of his nine children. Dean Benson was the recipient of the 2015 National Crop Insurance Services Outstanding Service Award in recognition for outreach to and work with small, limited resource, and socially disadvantaged farmers. Dean has been in crop insurance for 23 years and was an agency owner from 1999 to 2008, servicing policies in Washington and Oregon. He sold his agency in 2008 to Northwest Farm Credit Services, where he currently serves as Senior Vice President of Crop Insurance Services, working with 45 branch offices throughout Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana, promoting crop insurance risk management programs. Dean does not consider crop insurance agents as salesmen, but rather risk management consultants, tailoring the tools available to growers to best fit each individual situation. And that's exactly what uh, they each will be doing now. So, Gordon, take it away. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, our presentation today is going to be pretty basic. We'll talk about crop insurance uh, basics and then get into more detail with the whole farm revenue. And as uh, Jeff described, here's us. We're with Northwest Farm Credit Services. I'm going to jump right into uh, some of the basics uh, crop insurance overview and want to make sure that uh, you understand that this is really a high level overview. Uh, we're not going into any detail. Uh, I appreciate Janie's presentation. She had some information that uh, I will over to again. If you want specific information about crop insurance products in your area, you definitely need to find yourself a well-qualified licensed crop insurance agent to help you along with that. One thing uh, I wanted to do is maybe just show the relationship between the private industry and the federal crop insurance program. Uh, Janie mentioned a little bit of this, uh, but we are under the uh, USDA uh, budget. The crop insurance is, and back in 1980, this Federal Crop Insurance Corporation was formed uh, that oversees the program. And the management of that program is through RMA, or the Risk Management Agency. Uh, they interpret the policy language and uh, do various uh, uh, 
assignments in that. They also have regional offices that address more localized issues in the crop insurance. And then there's this relationship between the federal government and the private industry. And these companies that provide service for crop insurance are known as approved insurance providers. These are private companies who contract with the federal government to service the policies, work the claims, and do underwriting. This agreement that they uh, uh, agree to is called the Standard Reinsurance Agreement. It's renegotiated every few years, and I think at this point there's about 15 or so companies that have this agreement. And then the uh, insurance providers then uh, appoint licensed agents and agencies that work or the boots on the ground, uh, as Jamie put it, to uh, work with the growers in the marketing and the servicing of the policies. So that's kind of the relationship between the federal government and the private industry. There are many uh, federal crop insurance programs. I've just listed a few here. Uh, the most common is the multi-peril crop insurance. Multi-peril meaning that it covers a lot of those weather-related events. And uh, Janie uh, described a few of those in her presentation. But typically, they're divided up into uh, production history type programs, yield protection, uh, more based on, on uh, your production of, of yield and maybe some quality factors. There is a revenue protection policy that uses your average yield and then puts a price component into it to come up with a revenue guarantee. There's also what we call actual revenue history policies, very limited. I think there's just a couple commodities that have that now which will actually uh, use your past revenue history to develop guarantees from. There are livestock margin programs for dairy and swine. There's a livestock risk protection for feeder and fed cattle and lambs, pasture, rangeland, and forest products. And then the WFRP, or whole farm revenue protection, which we'll go into more detail uh, a little later, Dean will, on that product. Obviously, these programs vary by location and commodity. A uh, good source for that, and I think Janie had the link on her presentation, uh, the RMA website has a lot of good information regarding that. I want to go a little bit into the multi peril crop insurance and, and describe the various levels of coverage that a grower can choose, and really based on their own tolerance for risk and how much they want to protect. The basic coverage is what is called catastrophic coverage or referred to as CAT. That is a 50% guarantee based off of your average production. And if you have a loss, it would pay you 55% of the approved price. Uh, every crop in each county is considered an insurable unit, no matter how many acres you have. And the cost of that is $300 per crop per county. And it does not matter how many acres of that crop that you plant. So, you can see that a larger producer, this would be a very inexpensive way to insure your, uh, your crops. However, it's very minimal coverage. And from that point, you can buy up coverage. And one thing that's nice about federal crop insurance, they give you plenty of options. You can choose levels of coverage ranging from 50 to 75% of your actual production history. And in some counties and commodities, you can go as high as 80 and 85%. Uh, if you have a loss, they'll pay you up to 100% of that approved price. And one of the best uh, benefits of a buyout policy is being able to insure by what we call optional units. So these are separate guarantees based on fields that might be in uh, uh, separate locations or ownership share. There's some qualifications for those optional units. We won't go into those details. Once again, find yourself a good crop insurance agent that can describe those for you. Uh, Janie alluded to the fact that uh, the application process or the requirements uh, uh, can be, uh, are, are very important, I should say, and that uh, some of those requirements are this. You have to obviously fill out an application and each year have that renewed and update that application. And uh, then there's also reporting deadlines, and this is where you're going to report your production uh, is one of those. And we just wanted to reiterate the importance of having good, verifiable third-party records or pre-harvest appraisals by the AIP. It's very important in federal programs to ensure that the, the yields that you are certifying can be verified. Also, there's acreage reporting deadlines. Here's where you'll report what you've planted, what date you've planted it, 
and type of commodity, and uh, here recently, uh, additional requirements to report those by CLU or common land unit. Uh, in some crops, you do have other reporting uh, requirements. Uh, some crops require a crop contract. If you're farming organically, uh, you need to have organic certificates. You need to report changes in farming operation and entity changes. And one thing we just really want to point out is all of these reporting requirements have deadlines that are pretty uh, rigid and you have to make sure that you're well prepared and able uh, and willing to report those things timely. Let's talk a little bit about entity reporting. Uh, you have to provide a social security number or EIN or a RMA assigned number, what they call a RAN number, by the sales closing date. You need to verify your social security number annually and notify your agent of any entity changes. It's very important that you report uh, the way that you find, uh, farm uh, correctly, whether you're farming as an individual or whether you have a spouse or you're operating as a trust, partnership, corporation, or a joint venture. Uh, also, entities that ensure the crop must have ownership in the crop. Sounds pretty basic, but uh, very important. And also, information reported to other federal agencies, including FSA, and most recently, conservation compliance, must match the crop insurance policy. So it's very important that you're accurate in your reporting. Uh, as part of the claims process, all entity policy information will be verified. And I should show that. Okay, there we go. Uh, misreported information could impact your claim payments or void your coverage. So it's very important that, that we're accurate in the reporting. It's important to report your acreage and production data accurately to avoid coverage or claim reductions. And then if you do have a policy and you have uh, events that happen, it's important that claim notices are filed promptly. Uh, these might vary by the commodity and crop, but generally it's 72 hours after the discovery of the damage or not later than 15 days after the end of insurance period. And like I said, this could vary. depends on what crop uh, uh, insurance plan and product that you have. I want to give just a simple little example of how a yield loss would work and kind of show the theory behind federal crop insurance. Here I have an example, and let's assume that this grower has a 50 bushel per acre approved yield, which would uh, mean that he's provided that information and there's a calculation has been done to see what his average is. And let's assume for this example, the established price is $6 a bushel. And so a guarantee would be calculated by taking his average times the level of coverage that he's chosen in this example, we're choosing 85%, and that would give us a yield guarantee of 42.5 bushel. So let's assume that the harvest uh, happens and, and this grower harvests 35 bushel. And obviously from that, there's a deficit. His guarantee was 42 and a half, he harvested 35, his deficit or difference is 7.5 bushel. So the claim calculation would be 7.5 times that established price and that would be times his, his share of ownership in that crop. In this example, we're assuming the grower has 100% share, so the payment would be $45 uh, per acre in this example. Very simple example, but important to know that the guarantees are based off your average, and the policy is guaranteeing a production up to that. So if you outproduce that, if this grower uh, produced 43 bushel, there would be no payable claim because the guarantee was 42.5. This uh, last slide here that I have is just to let you know that most of the, or all of the AIPs that have uh, contracts to do the federal programs also have private products that they sell. These products are unsubsidized. They oftentimes have competitive rates and could actually be unique to their company. And some of those products are listed there. You can buy hell insurance, fire and uh, wind policies, winter kill, and, and so forth. So really the federal government along with these AIPs have created some great options for the grower to help uh, satisfy or fill the risk that you have in farming. And that ends my presentation. I'm now going to turn it over to Dean who will uh, talk about the whole farm revenue protection. Dean. Yeah, thanks Gordon. Um, again, just want to, uh, I guess, uh, reiterate that you know, what we're reviewing here is really looking at some of the options that are available to you for risk management and that we know that each farming operation is unique and that uh, 
you know, individual producers just need to look at, uh, you know, their tolerance for risk, uh, it, you know, take advantage of, of, um, of these programs that are out there and available to you. Uh, I always tell producers, you know, it doesn't cost you a dime to have uh, your agent run you a quote and see uh, how the program might work. And, uh, and, if, and if it works for you or different aspects of it work, then, then you can put those in place. So, um, again, this is just very high-level information that we're going to uh, be going over. Uh, I'm going to get into some particulars on the Whole Farm Revenue uh, Protection Program. And um, this has been a little bit of, a, of an evolution. Uh, we used to have uh, AGR and AGR Lite. Uh, that has now uh, uh, gone away and has been turned over to the Whole Farm Revenue uh, Protection Program. And um, we're going to kind of get into some details on this one. Uh, so, you know, Whole Farm Revenue Protection, what is it? These are what we're going to be reviewing with you. What are some of the benefits? Uh, where is it currently available and what are plans for expansion? Uh, what does it take to be eligible for this program? Some of the policy features and, and how does it work at claim time? Um, we understand based on, uh, you know, the, the slides that, that Jeff did at the beginning that um, some of our examples may be a, a little out of tune with um, some of you on the call. I want you to understand that the revenue pieces of this and the coverage and the cost, um, everything's pretty much proportionate. So, um, again, you'll be able to work with your local, uh, you know, licensed agent to kind of work through some of, some of the uh, details as it pertains to your farming operation. So, whole farm revenue, what is it? Well, basically it's a revenue safety net for all your commodities. Everything that you grow on your farm and your entity uh, is basically covered with a couple of exceptions. But it really works as an umbrella policy over your entire farming operation. So, you get to uh, look at your past history of your revenue, what your projected revenue is, and we're going to walk through some real uh, particulars on some of that so that we can show you really how this is designed to work. Um, a, a, a quick example here would be if you had a, a revenue trigger of $100,000 based on your history and, and, uh, and what's going on with your farming operation, and at the end of the day when the dust settled, you only were able to bring in $85,000, you would be in a $15,000 deficit, that would be your whole farm uh, revenue uh, payment, claim payment. So it can, it can really establish you a, a base or a floor. So that when you are meeting with lenders um, and, and other folks um, regarding your, you know, your risk protection, you can, you can show you've got a, a floor. Um, you know, the, we're going to go over here some examples. And again, keep in mind these numbers are maybe a little higher from what we saw in that original uh, questionnaire that we did. But we're looking at this one as a, as a real life example. This is a, this is a producer that has three commodities. And and, and as we look at this, we're going to start with, you know, what are my input costs associated with my farming operation? What does it cost to, to bring that crop to harvest and, and harvest? And in this particular case, we've, we're, we're using about a $270,000 figure for those total input costs. When I look at the whole farm revenue, and we'll show you how we got to this uh, approved revenue, uh, we've said, okay, we've got an approved revenue of $343,000. We went through the, uh, the worksheets on how, to, you know, how much revenue they were expected to bring in. That was $356,000. And, and this particular grower elected the 80% coverage level, so their income trigger would be 80% of the $343,000, which was their approved revenue, or $274,000. Now I think it's important to look, okay, how does that $274,000 equate to uh, the total input cost? And, if you had a wreck, if you have a hailstorm, or it froze out, or all these other things that can happen to you, um, you know, are you going to be able to pay the bills? And that's really what this is designed to do. And you can pick and choose coverage levels that make sure that you're meeting what those input costs are, and at the end of the day, pay the bills. So, what does it cost? Uh, this particular example that we did, we, we we, um, we're using that $274,000 revenue trigger, and for the whole farm revenue piece of this, cost would be about, you know, $2,000. Um, we've got another $1,800 uh, for a cost of the underlying coverage, the MPCI programs that Gordon talked about, and, uh, and as a combination of those two, 
and we'll show you how they work together. Um, total annual cost of about $3,800. The cool thing about this is if you look at that coverage, uh, the 274000 uh, versus the cost, we're really looking at a 1.38% a you know, premium rate. So it's very, very uh, uh, inexpensive. I mean, it's highly subsidized. It's, uh, it just makes it very affordable for producers to look at this. And we'll go through some more examples that kind of outline how some of that works. You know, as we look at uh, whole farm revenue versus the AGR and AGR light, uh, which I'll show you in another slide or two, um, it really has, there's, there's some great improvements that took place. Uh, first off, I just mentioned the premium ratio, uh, you know, coverage to premium ratio is very appealing, makes it very affordable. Um, our liability uh, on, on these, which is the coverage that you can have or the income that you have there, uh, increased up to $8.5 million across all approved counties. For AGR, uh, it was $6.5 million. For AGR Lite, it was only a $1 million that was available previously. Uh, so this is a pretty significant uh, improvement. On the claim payment rate, um, has gone up to 100%. So if you're in a loss, you're going to get paid dollar for dollar for everything that you're short of your uh, of your revenue uh, guarantee for revenue trigger. Um, that's a change on the AGR AGR light. It was a, you could select a 90% payment rate or a 75% payment rate. So a nice uh, nice improvement there with whole farm revenue. Um, AGR, AGR light, and when we kind of look at what was available in 2014 versus 2015, the adjusted gross revenue was just available in a, in a kind of a limited number of counties in, in the U.S. AGR uh, uh, light was available in some additional counties, but still there was a lot of the country that was left off. As we moved into whole farm revenue, you can see where we picked up uh, another substantial uh, part of the country and made this program available uh, to most of the country. And I can tell you, uh, you know, talking to RMA, I know they are working towards uh, expanding uh, uh, whole farm revenue. Um, I'll show you a little bigger map here, but whoops. Um, Expanding whole farm revenue inside of those areas that are that are currently uh, not served for in 2015. So, we think in 2016 this is going to be available nationwide. And um, so, if you haven't been paying attention, now's a good time to start paying attention because I think this is really important for you as you look at this as part of the package for the risk management program that you're developing for your farming operation. Okay. So, what are some of the el eligibility requirements? Um, Again, you got to have the tax IDs and all that, but you, you need to file for this program. You need to file either a Schedule F or another tax form uh, that can be uh, converted to a substitute Schedule F. Hey, We're going to be. Dean, can I just back back you up? There's a. There's a. Can you go back a slide? Yep. Um. Oh, uh, maybe not. Sorry. Carry on. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Oh. Go ahead. Um. So the Schedule F piece, that's where we're going to be pulling the revenue and expenses off of those tax forms to be able to determine what your, um, what, what your revenue history is and your expense history. You've got to have at least five consecutive years of, of uh, tax forms uh, for us to work off of. For 2015, it was 2009 through 2013. Um, uh, for 2016, as we're, as we're moving forward here, you're going to need 2010 to 2014 the current tax year is always a leg year. That's not, that doesn't come into play. Um, you have to have at least a buy-up level of coverage on your federal crop insurance if you're going to if you're going to do the underlying coverage. Um, you don't, you're not required to do the underlying coverage, but you can't have a cap policy. And Gordon reviewed that with you a little bit. So if you have cap, that's going to make you ineligible for whole farm revenue. You got to go to a buy-up level or cancel the underlying coverage completely. And then there's some diversification requirements that you need to make sure you're looking at and talking to your agent about. Uh, for example, if you are 100% a potato grower, you're not eligible for this program. You have to have a, another commodity that comes into play. There are a few of those types of commodities out there. They're very rare, but um, you need to know what those rules are and, and looking at that. And also, the, the uh, I know in looking at the slide, we have a number of producers that have multiple commodities, and that can be a real plus for you because it actually gives you some diversification and some better 
uh, rate factoring as we as we work through this, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And when you talk about a commodity, you don't mean uh, like the five commodities. You you just mean a uh, a product. When I talk about yeah, commodities for my purposes are really a uh, you know what we're talking about here. Okay, any agricultural product established or produced on the farm operation with the exception of timber, forest, and forest products, animals for sport, show, or pets. I mean, really, truly, this one where if there isn't an underlying program for strawberries in Virginia and you're growing strawberries, you can have your strawberries insured under your whole farm revenue. Okay? It's, it's, it covers pretty much everything um, as far as uh, growing commodities. Those lists are available out there. I think the... Um, you know, on account or a state by state basis, and but I'll tell you, it, on, that's on the RMA website. But I, you know, you'll be able to go through a list of all these different commodities, and then there's the all other co categories. So it really is pretty much everything except for these. I talked about the coverage levels that are available. Um, you can go from 50 to 85. Again, similar to the MPCI programs, for the 80 and 85 percent levels of coverage, you have to have at least three or more qualifying commodities. So I'll review that really quickly here. Uh, so a qualifying commodity, if you just have one commodity, that means 100 percent of your income is being generated off of that commodity. Two commodities, in order to qualify for some of the uh, additional subsidy benefits, You've got to have at least 16.65% of the re projected revenue for that second commodity, um, at least at that level. To, to qualify for that third commodity, where you can go up to the 80 and 85% levels, uh, that third commodity has to represent at least 11.1% of your projected revenue uh, for your farming operation. Now, one thing that's really cool about this is that if you had a number of smaller commodities, uh, that weren't, you know, one of them wasn't doing the 11.1, but your three, four, five, and six commodities um, in, in aggregate worked up to that 11.1%, you qualify then for a third commodity. Those get to be added together uh, to kind of get to that third commodity, which is really a big deal. You get higher coverage levels and better subsidies. Again, here's uh, talking a little bit about the Schedule F, five years of tax returns. We're going to be looking at the revenue and the expenses on these pieces, and there is, you know, there's some work that we have to do here, and we're going to be working very closely with, uh, we would work very closely with the producers and, and their accountants in some cases to really determine, you know, what pieces of the revenue that we get to count, um, which ones can't we count, um, which uh, expenses do we count, and which ones we don't count as we put together your uh, five-year revenue and expense history. So this is why the filing the taxes is an important component of this product because um, we're going to go to this Schedule F. It is, it is the go-to document for establishing the, that history. Here's an example of uh, revenue and expense history. And again, this was based on a 2015 policy, but you can see the five years that we have, 2009 through 2013. Now this is kind of an extreme example because we're showing the revenue increasing on this farming operation every year. Um, you can see under the average revenue, straight line average is $165,000. Um, there are some rules that allow for an expanding operation if you're increasing acres and you've got some new things coming into production, that there are some rules available that we can approach the companies and say, hey, this qualifies for an expanding operation and actually get a number higher than your five-year straight line average. And then there's also some rules that come into play regarding uh, indexing and this index revenue. And in this particular case, you can see that five-year history, and every year it's kind of increasing, okay? And so right off the top, we're looking at, uh, you know, this one here qualified for almost the maximum index value, and it goes from that straight line average of 165 uh, at a, you know, really a two times that um, on, the, on the factor that we're able to use, and it takes it up to 343,000. We're going to show you how that's important as we move forward. It's really the same story on the expense side. We're looking at that five-year uh, expense history. We'll put that together. Um, again, there are some indexing factors that come into play, and, um, and so we end up with a, an approved expense figure 
and we're going to show you why that's important to know what that is. Um, as you look at the intended farm operations report, you know, this particular producer, now we're going to do this annually and we're going to say, okay, what are you putting in the ground? What are you planting? Uh, how many acres? What's the, you know, the measure that we're using? What's that production that you're going to pull off of that particular uh, crop? Um, what's the price that you expect to receive on those, com on those commodities? What's the total revenue that you expect to receive? And when we look at that on this particular example, uh, they're projecting about 356000 uh, for this next year uh, that we're going to be insuring. So the whole farm revenue program says, okay, you know, look at your expected, look at your either your straight line, your, your uh, average or your index revenue. In this case, we're using the index revenue. And you get to, you, you can only go the, the lower of those two numbers. So even though their expected is a little higher, uh, we're not going to be able to insure all of that. So the index average is, uh, excuse me, the index revenue is the one we're going to use. Take the lower of, that's the 343,000. Again, I want you to keep in mind this is proportion as we talk through some of these things. If your farming operation isn't this big, your coverage is going to be lower, your cost is going to be lower. It's all proportionate. So this particular example, 343000 of approved whole farm revenue. The grower selected the 80% coverage level with the three qualifying commodities. So his revenue trigger point, 274000 We talked about the expenses. 205,000 was the um, indexed expense average. Uh, yeah, they allow you about a 30% cushion. So 70% of the allowable expenses is going to be your expense trigger. So in this case, it'd be 143,970. That's really important to understand that. Where if you didn't have harvest, or uh, you know maybe you got wiped out early in the in the crop season, and there just was a lot of labor that you didn't have involved in your farming operation. If your expenses drop below what that expense trigger is um, when, when we're working on the claim situation, they're going to be reducing your, your revenue trigger proportionately. Um, basically, I mean, we think it's a good concept. If you're not spending the money that was really established as part of your income history, then we're going to make some adjustments as they go through the claims process. So it's just important to know as you work with your uh, in individual agents out there that, that um, have them identify what your expense trigger is going to be so you have that number as well. So here we, we talk about um, kind of the coverage again, 274000 What's the premium with that underlying MPCI? So if we add in the potatoes and, and the other uh, premiums that were on those policies, um, the whole farm revenue piece would be that uh, $1,992 on this example. If you decided to not have the underlying MPCI coverage, uh, your total cost would be $3,821. So it's still fairly reasonable, um, but you don't have that individual standalone coverage um, like Gordon talked about with the underlying MPCI programs where maybe you have one field or one unit on an underlying coverage that gets wiped out. You could get paid on that one even though you exceed your revenue on your whole farm. Um, so they can, they can work separately, yet together. The important thing to understand is wh why, you know, why are we talking about this underlying MPCI coverage is because <clears throat> you're going to buy those. Those claims are going to be settled first. They're going to work through the claims process. If you have claims on the underlying coverage, those are going to be paid, and that is going to be revenue to count. Uh, as part of your, your total revenue that we're going to be looking at uh, as in comparison to your whole farm revenue trigger, uh, if you're in a claim or not. Um, the claims requirements, similar, uh, similar issue with the 72-hour uh, notice. You know, if you think you have a problem out there, uh, get it turned in. You just, it's important as those events happen that you're talking to your agent, you're getting those claim notices turned in so they can get them turned into the to the company or the AIP so that they can get an adjuster assigned to those and get in contact with you to start doing any inspections or anything that needs to take place uh, during the growing season. Um, in some cases, you might harvest a full crop and uh, you might not know what all the revenue that is coming off of those crops yet. Um, sometimes if you're doing small grains, you might be in storage and not sold yet and some other crops that uh, do store. 
Um, so the bottom line is, is, is uh, if you have those kinds of commodities and you don't have that revenue yet, you, you, you still have to go ahead and file uh, a claim within 60 days of filing your tax forms in order for the policy to stay intact. If you miss these windows, um, your coverage is basically null and void. Um, claims are going to be settled after you file your taxes for the insurance year. So, um, so for that next year, you're going to file your taxes. That's when that clock starts ticking to make sure that you've got your claim notice turned in within that 60 days. Um, they are going to work to establish an accrued value on the crops that you were growing that year and that were part of your program. Um, and they're going to include, you know, the revenue that you, that you had for any uh, harvested and sold production. They're going to establish a value on crops that maybe were harvested but not sold yet. And they're kind of you have to put, a, put an estimated value on those. Um, they're going to take out, you know, not, they don't want to count any revenue for commodities that, that you received in this year from previous crop years. So they got to make sure they're pulling that revenue out and not including that. They're also going to include any of the, um, of the claims payments. And, um, and then if, if you had some unharvested crops that still had value, um, they would have to add that in as well, um, even though you may, elect it, may have elected not to harvest those. So um, again, working with the companies to establish all of those little pieces of the puzzle to come up with you know, what is the, the revenue to count. You know, this is a, just a quick example showing kind of, the, of, a, of a calendar year a tax filer. Um, coverage is going to attach January 1 or 10 days after you make the application, um, uh, if it's after January 1st. Um, if, you, if you apply prior to, uh, you know, the, basically the 20th of December, um, you're going to have coverage in place starting on January 1. You have until March 15th to make application. Understand though that there will be a, there's a 10 day waiting period for the company to uh, to accept those applications, and so if you waited till the deadline of March 15th, coverage wouldn't go into place till March 26th. So uh, just if, if you think you're going to be in this program, it's best to get started early, get get your application in so that you're covering this entire window uh, as possible. You can kind of see then after you after your application is attached. Could be you know weather related issues that come into play. It could be market related issues that come into play on your commodities. That's the, the beauty of this program that it's not just weather related. It could be just a downturn in commodity prices that impact your your returns. Uh, but they're going to work through this uh, harvest season. They're going to settle the the underlying coverages if you have those in place first. So you can see the MPCI claim payment, um, and then when you file your taxes. Uh, sometime after the first of the year, that'll start the claims process for the whole farm revenue, and they'll start gathering all those pieces of information to establish a value on the on the crops that you are you are insuring. Just a real quick uh, claims uh, you know example here. Remember our two hundred and seventy four thousand dollar revenue trigger uh, on this particular customer when the dust settled. All the uh, all the revenue to count was uh, two hundred thousand dollars. That left them uh, seventy four thousand five hundred and eighteen dollars short of their revenue trigger, and that in turn was their whole farm revenue claim payment. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jeff. Great. Well, we have a ton of great questions. <clears throat> um, so uh, let's let's just uh, jump in. Um, there's a question about the, the optional units, um, really uh, how, how they work and uh, what unit of insurance is ideal. Well, optional units uh, have some criteria in order to, uh, to qualify for them. And in our area here, uh, the biggest one would be either ownership share. So if I have a field that I own 100% of and I have another field uh, you know, a mile down the road that, that I have a 50% share with someone else, then that might qualify me to insure those as separate units. Or it could be just that I have fields in a separate legal section. Uh, so in our area here, we, we have township and range, and so if we're in a separate section of a township and range with corn, let's say, 
in two different sections, then I can insure those separately. Uh, each commodity has a little bit uh, and can have a little bit different rules on what qualifies for an optional unit. So you really have to get with a, a good agent to kind of walk you through that. Uh, there's no doubt though the value of a multi feral policy, yield production or whether it's a revenue production, uh, comes in the ability to divide up optional units. So not all of your commodity is thrown together as one unit. And, and I'll add, uh, Jeff, that it's important to uh, have your production records that you can track those separately by those optional units. That you have to be able to, to show separate uh, separate yield histories and, and, at, and at claim time be able to separate that production out and show exactly what came off of which, which unit. So mm -hmm. record keeping, again, is critical. Mm -hmm. um, That's a theme rules, here. That? Definitely a theme. Keep, keep those <laughs> records. A um, uh, question is, can uh, land on a 100-year floodplain qualify for federal crop insurance? There's some, uh, in the crop insurance, uh, there are uh, risk areas. And so if you're growing a crop in a, a something that's unclassified risk or maybe something that's not uh, part of that, you do have the ability to submit a what they call a written agreement. It's basically a request to insure you would need some past records history to substantiate the fact that you can grow, you know, an average yield in that area. Uh, so that's definitely uh, a possibility to request that. Uh, don't know if you'll get it or not. It depends on the regional office and what they're feeling like at the time and what your past history has been. If, if it's in a rated area, then, you know, there's no problem. You should be able to just apply and, and rock rock on. But but there are different risk areas um, and there's maps that are out there that kind of show some, some of these things. And so depending on um, where you're located, there could be different rate factors that come into play for your particular uh, commodity crops that you're insuring. So. Okay. Um, you know, Janie was talking about uh, per, uh, being careful with production. There's a question here um, for uh, the WFRP uh, defrost date matter. So if you plant your vegetable seedlings before the last frost free date uh, and then it freezes, can you make a claim? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, there are on the underlying coverage, there are like final plant dates and some things that come into play um, on the whole farm revenue. Um, you know, I don't know if we've run into that issue here. Um, I mean, most of our producers are are uh, you know meeting the planting requirements that are that are part of the federal guidelines as as far as the underlying coverage goes. Um, but I would say, what's I mean, maybe it goes back to you know what's normal farming practices in your area. Uh, you know, working with the extension office to see you know is this a is this a good day to uh, to be planting or not. I know in some areas where if you plant ahead of that, of, of a certain plant date window, that, um, you know, it's not covered and you would have to replant in order to get, um, to, to get coverage to attach. And some of this might uh, fall under uh, what Janie mentioned before is good farming practices. It's exactly what Dean's saying. Mm -hmm. You have to follow good farming practices and if you're planting in an area or a time that you know is not Good practice. You probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, and Jeff, this is this is yeah. Janie. I want to add just a little bit to that. You know, a lot. And Gordon and Dean jump in here too. A lot of these policies, particularly the newer ones, um, really don't have a strong track record of you know arguments that have you know made their way into the court system, God forbid, or something like that. Um, and and so sometimes we might we might give you an answer of it depends because literally it depends. Uh, some of these things aren't just fully tested out yet in terms of areas that ha could be a potential legal issue or a conflict area between um, the policyholder and, and the system. Um, but I think that's why it's so, 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 so important to have, you know, great records and, and, a, and be able to, you know, fully document, you know, what you're doing in your production uh, units all over the place and and also to align yourself and stay um, 
stay aligned with whoever are the experts in your area with regard to not only um, just the general circumstances of farming in your area, but also with your particular types of production systems and your crops and, and you know, having them in your corner and talking to them regularly and, you know, th that's the kind of quote unquote evidence that that's going to come into play when if there is a battle about what's a good farming practice or not. It's, it's all going to hinge on records and, and uh, what is generally accepted in the, in the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just add to that too. Um, I appreciate that. You're spot on, Janie. Um, but I'll tell you, any of these questions that you know, it's like, wh what can I do? Uh, kind of a kind of a scenario. I can tell you daily. We are running things by the companies that we work with. They in turn run things by RMA for determination and for uh, you know just to get some some of these questions answered because it's not black and white and. Uh, and there are a lot of things that come up that just have to be run up the flagpole, and and then we get everybody on the right page. Okay, uh, you you mentioned before that it's not required to have uh, the MPCI in order to have the whole farm uh, revenue protection. Is that true? Yeah, that's absolutely true, and that was a change that they made. Is that you can opt out of the underlying coverage, the MPCI programs. Um, and just you know, just have whole farm as a standalone if you'd like, or you can pick and choose which crops that you want uh, to maybe put an underlying coverage or an MPCI coverage on, um, but you don't have to have them all. The one requirement is right now, and, and we're kind of we're hoping that we can institute a little change here, but currently they're saying if you have that cat level of coverage, the catastrophic level, the one that costs you $300 per crop per com uh, per county. Uh, if you have that level of coverage, that will exclude you from whole farm revenue. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And so it is that that MPCI is it the three hundred dollar flat fee per crop per county? Is it? You can't have you can't have that level. That's the, cat, oh, the catastrophic level. Uh -huh. You have to do a buy up level or no coverage at all. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, do you? Do you know if anyone's developed an app for quick reporting or website or something to make reporting easier? <laughs> um, you know, uh, no. <laughs> um, uh, usually, wow, I mean, that's an idea. Yeah, business. <laughs> there we go. Here's the deal, though. I mean, it, it, these, these programs are fairly, they are fairly complicated, and there's just so many darn rules and regs about setting up unit structure and doing the different things that, and what numbers do we put in on the whole farm? Which ones do we count? Which ones do we don't? That's why, I mean, I, um, this is my plug for having a good insurance agent again and, and working with a company that understands these programs because mm -hmm. there are just a lot of things that come up. And, and, and I think to, to just have people trying to do this on their own, what, what we've seen is that, as a rule, that hasn't worked real well, um, that there's a lot of T's that have to be crossed and a lot of I's that have to be dotted in order to complete this stuff. So you, you may not have experience uh, to, to answer this, um, but if you do, uh, are are people are agents across the country pretty well trained up on whole farm? Um, well, I can't speak for for everybody. I, it's it's a new program, um, so it's you know it's it's gradually uh, getting the word out. I know in the Pacific Northwest, um, you know, we've really kind of taken the lead on it in our area here uh, with our staff and helping out some other groups across the country. Um, but, um, but I would say if I, that's one of the things that we've identified uh, on, on our top 10 list for improvements for 2016 is education for agents, education for our companies that we work with. Uh, their underwriters and claims folks to make sure that um, that you know it, it, people are getting trained up properly on this, so that they can sit down with producers and make sure that they, you know, are explaining it in detail. Yeah, and I'm, this is Janie. I want to add a little bit to that, uh, Jeff. If you actually look back onto the Raffi slides that I put in the last part of my presentation, it actually bears out what I can't remember whether it was Gordon or Dean talking. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. It, there seem to be pockets that Raffi was able to determine that have kind of a good uptake right now, early, like early adopters of, of Whole Farm. 
and I would I would bet you a dollar that 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 could be linked to folks just becoming more aggressive, like Dean and Gordon have been in their region about really understanding it well. And I think the longer it's out there, the more we're going to see uh, pervasive knowledge improvement. I think it's just uh, it, granted it's a new it's a new product and it takes a little bit of time to get people all on the same page. But hmm. yeah. In I fact, think Raffi's I think Raffi's data actually might reflect that hmm. of pockets where improvement could happen. Yeah, one of one of the attendees mentioned that uh the most interest is in Washington, Oregon, Idaho and Montana and uh there was a he was curious as to why and I think the answer is Gordon and Dean. <laughs> well they're the we superstars. <laughs> we have 26 agents in the four states that uh, we have trained up very well to uh, go out and, and, and get in front of a lot of producers. And, and um, I'll tell you, and here's the bottom line, I've said this to risk management agency, is that you know, folks gravitate to what they know. And so if you don't understand it, then you're going to be a little slow to want to get out there and try to present it to, to your customers. And I think that's our goal is to just keep spreading the word and get more and more folks that are informed that can help spread the word because this is a, a terrific tool for producers to be looking at. Well, and Jeff, that's something that we can do as well is to keep offering things like this, uh, just uh, more in-depth webinars on on that as well as some of the other uh, products and just raise everybody's comfort level about mm -hmm. how this all works as it continues to roll out and become more available across more products. I think that ongoing education piece is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. A um, uh, couple quick questions. Uh, is uh, cross-contamination of product in transport covered by crop insurance? I, I, would, I, would, I would say no. I would say no. I, I don't think, I, once it leaves the field, um, you know, other than some market value, but it, it has to be an insurable cause of loss. Um, and I, yep. I, I don't think so. I think you're right. This is Janie, and I, I would also suggest to whoever asked that question that that might be an area that you want to look at some just general policies. Mm -hmm. And what about general insurance policies? Uh huh. Sure. Uh, coverage for environmental or hazmat contamination? In the field? Mm hmm. As a rule, no. <laughs> okay, so so these are yeah. these are again it, as you said so this would be another general insurance or perhaps it could it could be a, a litigation issue. Well, usually what it boils down to, if let's say we have some kind of a spray issue that you know the neighbor sprayed their field and it impacted your crops, uh, the the answer is going to be you need to go after your neighbor. Um, mm -hmm. That's not insurable. Right. Well, and that's where a general insurance policy would be better served for you, number one. And number two, um, you know, this demonstrates really a great opportunity for me to hammer again, Jeff, at read your policy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, a lot of people sign up for insurance, car, homeowner, boat, it doesn't matter, and they never read the policy. Mm. And, you know, that's, we, I think Jeff and Gordon and I are really adamant. You've got to read your policy. You've got to understand the terminology and, and walk through with your agent what kinds of things are covered or not. But I think they're right. Um, just probably the last couple of examples probably fall into a general insurance issue as opposed to these particular products. I would agree. I always like to end uh, with a uh, provocative thought question. Um, and Liz provided us one. She asks, what would agriculture be like without crop insurance? Whoever wants well, to take, take that. Answer. Yeah, go ahead, Jamie. <laughs> I'll go first. Go ahead. Without, without crop insurance, you're talking having farmers out there going pillar to post from disaster to disaster. And we would have a lot more failures of producers than we have. And I think people underestimate the value of crop insurance to, to really be a safety net for people on the ground who are actually involved day to day trying to keep it out of the ditch and moving forward in, in whatever their production systems are. And I don't want to be in a world without crop insurance, quite frankly, because I don't believe Congress is going going to have the stomach any longer to actually do disaster bills. 
uh, like they used to do back in the old days, and Gordon and Dean and I were around doing this back then. <laughs> I just I don't even want to think about the economic um, risk that people would face without crop insurance. Well, and I'll just take on to that because it's, it's broader than just the individual farmer, okay, yeah. going out of business because they're uh, suppliers that don't get paid. Uh, they're not paying their loans off. They're not, you know, I mean, it, the, the ripple effect would be huge. You know, yeah. our agency alone pays out millions of dollars a year in claims. And I'm telling you right now, that's not going into the pockets of the producers. That's going into the, the bills that have to be paid mm. to, uh, you know, allow them to farm next year. And I think uh, that's the ripple effect. I think that it would be far reaching. And I think I it's important on a national level too. And I always call it it's national security. I mean, you have to have a food supply and you have to have folks that know how to produce that food to do it. And uh, there are a lot of risk in farming that all farmers know that are way beyond their control. Number one being the weather. And if we don't protect that, if we don't to give them the opportunity after a big natural disaster to continue to farm, to continue to produce that food for the general public, then, you know, we're going to be in a world of hurt. So uh, it is here to stay, I would hope, and uh, the value is probably beyond measure. Well, thank you all. That was uh, fantastic. Um, let me just do a, a little closeout piece. Uh, farming is a high-risk business. In most cases, as we were talking about, very much dependent on outside forces like weather and pest migration patterns. Buying insurance is never going to increase your yield, but it can keep you on your land if something conspires against your crop yield. If you build crop insurance premiums into your business plan, it might just allow you to sleep a little sounder. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our site at ngfn.org slash webinars, along with the over 50 other webinars we've done in the past. Feel free to send others uh, who you think would like to have heard this presentation and take some professional development time uh, and dig through our ex excellent exercise uh, archives yourself. They are organized by topic in the left-hand navigation area. This webinar should be up within a few business days. Often, oftentimes we get it up in one day. Um, we do offer our NGFN webinars on the third Thursday of each month at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, noon 30 Pacific. Sign up links are at ngfn.org slash webinars and will be emailed to you if you get on our mailing list. In June, we dig into access to capital, farmer, food hub, processor, or institutional buyer. Access to capital to ensure business viability and growth is often quite difficult. Michael Schumann will present several innovative sources for capital, some that didn't even exist until recently. This one is a must see. And in August, we'll present a simple, valuable tool designed to step you through making the tough decisions for your business. It's like having a consultant with you, helping you step through to find the ideal solution for you. There will be the option to automatically sign up for these webinars in the post webinar survey. So avail yourself of that. Um, the Agricultural Marketing Service, who has for years maintained a farmer's market directory, has now added an on-farm market directory, a CSA directory, and a food hub directory. If you or people you work with are involved in any of those activities, please visit usdalocalfooddirectories.com and enter your information. Uh, you can find the National Good Food Network on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. The Wallace Center is also on Facebook. Come like us. You can search for Wallace Center at Winrock International. Again, um, if you haven't already, uh, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or really just let us know in the post-webinar survey, and we will sign you up. Please contact us at any time. Our email address is contact at ngfn.org. The NGFN would like to thank you for your time today. I'd like to thank uh, Janie, Dean, and Dean, and Gordon. Um, let me encourage you once again to fill out the survey that will open in your web browser. We do offer these webinars free to you, but we need to let our funders know about their impact. So uh, thank you for filling that uh, out our surveys. Uh, this concludes the webinar. Have a great day.